Okay. Uh, so I guess I should start by saying this isn't a TED talk, so I'm going to um and ah uh and, and all that and probably have to go back and forth a little bit, um, just like that. <laughs> uh, and, and it's also the first time I've done this particular presentation, and it is really like for a different audience, and I'm kind of like giving a presentation that's meant for one audience to a different audience. So uh, if, if I, I don't anticipate saying anything too ridiculously heady, but and, and I, I am not a very heady person myself, so I tend to, I tend to approach my academic work in a non-heady manner. But if I say something that, like, if I use, if I use a ridiculous word or, or if I say something that doesn't make sense, uh, feel free to interject. I've got maybe like 30 to 40 minutes worth of stuff, so you can interject at any time. But just, you know, if you want me to get through the whole thing, uh, then be wary or mindful of, of how many interjections uh, you, you take. So. My, my dissertation is on Dancing Rabbit as what I'm calling a lifestyle movement. And the importance of this is that, is that lifestyles often go overlooked as a source of social change. We tend to, we tend to think about uh, social movements in one way, and I'm saying that that's too narrow, that social movements aren't, aren't, the, aren't uh, the only source of this particular type of, of change in society, and that we need to be looking at lifestyle as also uh, part of doing the same thing that social movements do. And so I'm attacking the literature in that way. So lifestyle, just I have to use an academic definition because that's, uh, that's part of the requirement of being an academic. Um, so Featherstone writes, of course, that lifestyle refers to habits, stress, and common meanings for a specific group. Everybody here has a general understanding of, you know, we all kind of dress to a certain standard and, and have relatively similar st standards uh, of, of dress and meaning and habits and all that. Um, and then lifestyle movements, <coughs> which uh, for the people here are earlier, I actually met this, uh, this guy, Hainfleur, at a, at a conference, and I'm using his, his concept, and he's been helping me out. He actually teaches at Grinnell, not too far from here. Um, lifestyles are, lifestyle movements are ones that promote a way of life as a primary means of creating social, uh, social change. And I'll, I'll talk about that, what that's in contrast to in a minute. And that um, this is important because up until recently, social movement literature, so academic writing on, on social movements, kind of fails to capture how lifestyle makes an impact because they tend to portray social movements as being very binary. So you have a protagonist and an antagonist. You have a bad guy and then you have some protesters outside protesting that bad guy for change, right? Um, that is what Hainfleur calls the contentious politics approach. Um, social movements are generally conceptualized based on uh, portrayals in direct action approach. So protests, strikes, yeah, um, or you know, property damage, uh, breaking and entering, and that kind of stuff, and military sites and, and uh, private corporations and, and destruction of property. Um, they have an active antagonist. All, in all of these cases, you know, the, pro, the protest, I don't know where I drew this from, this looks like it's uh, actually in Iran, so they're protesting a corrupt regime. A strike is, is protest against the management of a company. Breaking and entering is targeting something very specific. So in contrast, lifestyle movements um, tend to disperse that and not have an active antagonist. They promote individual action as opposed to the strike where everybody's there or a protest which requires a large mass of people to be effective. Lifestyle movements promote uh, individual action. They engage in private uh, versus, versus public and ongoing versus episodic. So um, the, the strike and the protest are, are uh, you know, one single instance of social movement action. Lifestyle movements, every action you take in a daily life is considered to be some sort of activity of a social movement. Um, and, and your private life, rather than what you go to do out in public, is considered to be part of that social movement. And uh, this is where it gets a little heady. Lifestyle movements pr participants subjectively understand their individual private actions as efforts towards social change, rather than um, in, a, in a broader social movement or a, a contentious politics movement. Uh, uh, as being there, there being distinct objectives or distinct distinct changes that need to need to happen in order for them to consider themselves having accomplished a goal. 
And then lifestyle movements also engage in identity work, which I'll talk about uh, also a little bit further, focusing particularly on cultivating morally coherent, personally meaningful identity in the context of collective identity. And uh, you know, contentious politics movements do this too, and I'll show how they overlap a little bit, but the notion is that uh, your everyday actions are building toward, toward something of a meaningful identity that is in contrast to uh, some vague antagonist, some unclearly defined um, opposition. So uh, some examples of lifestyle movements that, that are used by Hainfler um, and, other, and other authors that have subsequently built on this topic, veganism, who are, you, who are you opposed to when you're going vegan? Like who's your antagonist? Who are you, who are you against? It's, you know, there's, there's a, a broad sense of, you know, a wasteful culture or a morally corrupt uh, cu culture of eating meat that, that would lead people into this movement, but there's no, no one single target for this sort of activism. Uh, the tiny house movement, similarly, uh, can be seen as a lifestyle movement because every, every action you take is within this house or around the creation of this house and living out of this house. And you don't really have, you know, you're not like actively protesting the uh, National Home Builders Association or the National Association of Realtors. There's an ill-defined sort of opposition to this. Um, and then a very interesting one that's kind of on the flip side um, on the social and political spectrum is the, uh, uh, what were they called? The, uh, the uh, virginity pledger movement. People pledging to wait until marriage uh, to have sex with their partner. And, you know, this, this is significant because, there, I mean, there's no law that requires you to have sex before marriage. So it's not like they're, they're you know, pr protesting or creating an antagonist that, that's this one thing that can change, but they're addressing a, a wider culture that they see as, as morally cor corrupt and promiscuous and, and not at all okay. Usually very, very strongly Christian and, and, and seeing that as sort of against their, their Christian ideals. Or the, uh, uh, in a similar fashion, the Quiverful movement that uh, uh, is also a very religious-based movement that sees you know, their, their role in the world is to uh, populate as much as possible. Uh, what was, the, what was the, uh, the Duggar family? They're part of this movement um, that see, see it as very significant uh, that they, they need to be doing their part to populate the earth more and have as many kids as possible. So why, why, does DR, why do I think DR fits into this, this model? And this was a, a concept that I was not familiar with when, when I came here at first. Uh, but after talking to everyone, I, it just seemed to make 100% sense. It just totally fit into place really well. So lifestyle movements support individual action rather than having individuals only contribute to an organization. So what, I, what I'm saying is that DR in some sense, individuals contribute to what DR is, but then DR also shapes who the individuals are. Um, contentious politics, uh, the protests, the strikes, um, the property damage, those are participatory. People go to that and do that, but lifestyle movements are co-constituting. At, at, at once, people are participating in it, but are also being shaped by it. Um, which is not to say that protests can't shape, shape opinions as well, but um, the sort of the baseline for, for participation is co-constituting as opposed to participation. Is that, that, that's where I get pretty heady there. And I'm going to skip these. I don't like those. I created them, and then I think they're stupid, so I'm going to pass by them. <laughs> it's, I, love, I love to visualize things, you know, uh, and, and sometimes the, the visuals don't actually meet up with the words in my head. So I'm going to pass by that. And then another significant part is that lifestyle movements create what are called collective action reservoirs. That's a, a phrase from Hainfleur as well, where people who do participate in, um, in lifestyle movements can then go on to do uh, contentious politics actions. Because I know a lot of people here have, at one point or another, gone to a protest of some sort, either before coming here or, yeah, snap. I know Aaron went to that. Uh, uh, was there's a March Against Monsanto or something last year? No, no. <laughs> I don't. Know. The yeah, the climate march, the uh, power line stuff that that Amron's doing. So, you know, it it people here are typically, as with other lifestyle movements, politically inclined, um, but tend to bring their politics into their personal lives, 
as opposed to it being a public display, that their politics are very, are very uh, expressed in a very personal way. So uh, this doesn't show up super well, uh, but what uh, I'm trying to get at with this is that um, social movements encapsulate both lifestyle <laughs> politics, so the, uh, the, the everyday actions that you take to, to make a difference in the world, versus contentious politics, which are the events that one goes to uh, to try and make a difference. So those, those protests versus that lifestyle, that everyday habits, uh, dresses, and common meanings um, as, as created to make, make a change. Uh, lifestyle politics and contentious politics can, of course, overlap in the sense that uh, lifestyle movements serve as collective action reservoirs for contentious politics and, and protests. Obviously, you know what the next slide is. I, I, um, my methods were to answer this question about how lifestyle movements demonstrate political engagement of the private sphere of the personal life of the lifestyle. And so I came here is this little place called Dancing Rabbit Eco Village. Spent about eight months participant observation uh, last year, and I was in the visitor session for three weeks uh, the year before that. I think I spent a week here at Moon Lodge in the December of 2014, and now I'm here for another month. So lots of you know episodic participant observation, including 19 interviews with um, you know a, a hopefully a somewhat representative sample of of everybody here. That's half the population almost. Um, ranging from 15 minutes to one hour. And my results uh, were, first of all, um, rabbits tended to refer to being here as the biggest step in making, in making a change. Uh, that being here and participating in the uh, culture of dancing rabbit was in itself uh, doing something to change the world. Um, and also that it enabled other forms of action. Uh, being here, oop, that got changed around. Uh, but basically there were th three themes across which this broke down. There's finding a home for activism, finding the activist within, and then becoming an activist. Um, so all of these kind of variations on sort of being here as enabling someone to be an activist and make change. And all in the pursuit of this kind of common goal of uh, lowering an ecological footprint, living in an egalitarian fashion, um, and inspiring others to do the same. So, yeah. Oh, it's too bad Alyssa's not here. She was my first interview, um, and so uh, kind of set the tone for this, this, whole, this whole project. Um, and, and, of course, she, as you all know, is a midwife, and in other settings she described uh, that being a midwife was inherently felt like an act of protest in many other, in many other places, but that it felt only right and natural that she be a midwife here. Um, and she says, I'm living in a way that is very political and counterculture uh, and not normal or mainstream. Dancing Rabbit is educational and tries to teach people about it, but I kind of just live in my lifestyle and my work, making a statement about what my beliefs are in a lot of ways. So again, taking something that would be very combative and confrontational um, as someone who's doing it individually away from, from a lifestyle that that's, um, finds that to be strange, but integrating that integrating that here, and then the lifestyle itself becoming a, um, a, a political statement. Um, similarly, Dennis, um, he, he gave me a, a good long rambling interview, uh, and he said, uh, you know, he, he was an activist for a long time before coming here. Uh, it said it used, it used to be, for me, a lot, more, uh, a lot more changing policies, getting involved in protest actions or direct media events, et cetera, to raise awareness. I wanted results, I wanted to be able to see that we had gotten somewhere, and it was so frustrating not to. The important thing for me now is to do what is in my nature, to be involved in working towards good change and not be anxious about the results. I don't control the results, I only control what I'm doing and going in the right direction. So again, somebody who was involved with contentious political action before, uh, but found that lifestyle, lifestyle politics, lifestyle movement uh, fit, fit uh, where he was in life. Uh, better. And then Brooke, hey Brooke, <laughs> uh, you're, yeah, you're going to see a lot of uh, familiar names in here. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't quote everyone though. Um, 
Brooke said, I do feel like living this lifestyle is a form of silent activism, maybe not so silent. Silent as opposed to in your face protesting or Arctic drilling. For me and I think for several others, it is a way to make a difference and try to make a difference in the wider culture without having to battle people all the time. A more peaceful way of trying to make change instead of being combative. Yeah. Yeah, and so you see, I think I think a lot of people here uh, came under or came here under the same pretense that uh, the notion of of contentious politics, of being, you know, as she said, in in your face all the time, was was um, for them an ineffective way of making change, and so transferred the way uh, that they wanted to make change into into a different sphere, into the personal, the lifestyle activism, as opposed to. Uh, going out there to protest. Um, uh, Aaron captured, <laughs> captured this pretty well. Um, he, said, <laughs> he said, that's an Angora rabbit. Um, Does it have yeah. legs? It looks like a yeah, it has legs. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not that cruel to rabbits just yet. Um, anyway, he said, basically, we need to tell them to go fuck themselves while we're also growing our own vegetables, doing our car co-op, and preserving our own organically grown food for the train ride to the big protest in Washington, D.C. I think that all needs to happen simultaneously, yeah. thus showing, of course, that lifestyle activism, oh yeah, that lifestyle activism still serves as a collective action reservoir that, that uh, by being uh, politically inclined in one's personal actions also leads them, or their personal like day-to-day -day habits, inclines them to do other political things. Uh, yeah, yeah, similarly, Lauren said, Lauren, Lauren said, I've been told by so many people, well, this was how the world is and you have to accept it. And guess what, I don't. You have to find the right venue to, uh, to find your one little corner of the world that you can change and focus on it and make it better. So if DR can be seen as that opportunity, that is a movement. Yeah. Um, and she also, she also said, people used to ask me um, oh, why, why, why I seem so agitated all the time. And I said, of course I'm agitated all the time. I'm an activist. <laughs> okay. Um, and so other, other people, um, the second theme is finding an activist within that uh, people who were not necessarily engaged in, in any form of contentious political action but had the inclination to be politically active in one form or another came here and found a means of expressing that. Uh, Ray, for example, says just living here is a form of activism. I don't want to argue about climate change. I don't want to convince somebody. I want to show them juicy details to the people that have interest. I can talk to people about it here because they don't think I'm crazy. I don't have to convince them, so it's easier for me to have the, have the conversation. Reflecting the difficulty of engaging in contentious sort of discussions um, in the wider world, but finding a safe haven to be um, contentious and be, be different and, and be trying to engage in social change here. And Ray's not here, is she? Oh, OK. I was going to have her fill in the next one because I asked her, you know, what do you think of when I say the words uh, social movement? And she said, woohoo! And she would do it a lot better than I could, so. <laughs> um, similarly, Kyle, Kyle described not really being an activist, uh, going to an activist college, but nonetheless not really uh, engaging a in a lot of politics, working for a PERG, Progressive Interest Research Group, doing some petitioning at some point and saying, I've done maybe two, one or two peace marches, but that was probably 10 years ago. And he said, the closest thing I would consider myself an activist is as someone who lives here. And so uh, being more comfortable with that definition of someone who's actively trying to change the world uh, in, through their everyday actions, that makes more sense to call, that, call him that than it did uh, even when he was going to an activist college or participating in a peace march. Um, and then similarly, uh, becoming an activist, uh, this was the final theme, and the, and the fewest number of people, people who didn't really seemed, seem too politically inclined, uh, but then sort of found, found that within themselves or developed that within themselves after moving to Dancing Rabbit. Sable, who you'll, it's, she wanted her name changed, so I, I did that, but you'll probably recognize who it is, said, I, I would say the biggest thing that I did uh, that was actively social work was choosing a lifestyle that was DR. That has been the biggest thing I've ever done uh, that made a difference. Basically, I put my money where my mouth is and moved to an intentional community, which, of course, she said she originally moved here as more out of like a prepper mindset, but then became more of an activist as, as time went on. 
Okay, so you know, to, to kind of get a bigger grasp on this, um, what I'm trying to get at is that lifestyle uh, movements, the idea is that you're politicizing your everyday actions and you're not going to a protest to do political things. Every action you take in your private spaces in your personal life is in some way political. Maybe not always intentionally, but by setting up a, um, by setting up a, a lifestyle in a community that inherently is, is engaged in social change, that, that trickles down to meaning that all of your actions unintentionally or intentionally are in some way political. Um, and that, of course, with no clear antagonist, I mean, who's DR's antagonist? Who are you protesting? Who are you, who are you trying? <laughs> yeah, right. Right, yeah, trying to, trying to change the world, the, the everything, yeah. So there's no, there's no um, other distinguishing criterion for describing Dancing Rabbit as a social movement other than um, a lifestyle that is inherently uh, politically charged. Uh, <coughs> The, a private of private life that's inherently politically charged, um, and this this kind of meshes. This is a little bit back into the academic literature. This meshes with what's called anti-politics, the retreat of engagement from politics in the public sphere. Um, this is something that uh, uh, Carl Boggs, who's a political scientist, writes a lot about. That um, in this country, people tend to feel uh, fairly uneducated and ineffective when it comes to engaging in the, the public sphere, engaging in government, um, engaging in conventional like legislative politics, um, and feel, feel like when they, when they go to protest something, their voice isn't heard, or when they go to try and make a statement about changing something in public, they don't feel like they know enough, uh, and so refrain. Um, one thing that comes to mind is, is the last time I went to a protest in D.C. Um, I was also doing, I was also doing interviews for my, my thesis, and I interviewed someone who, uh, who knows about the School of the Americas? Yeah, a couple of people. It's a, the largest, was the largest recurring protest in, in the United States. Happened every year in Fort Benning, Georgia. And the person, person there said, you know, the, the reason they chose that site you know, if you come to D.C. and you draw 25,000 people for a protest, well, big whoop, that's a Tuesday. And how does, how does that feel to know that, you know, there, all these masses of people come out to protest and you're just one of them and then nothing changes because it's just, you know, it's an everyday action in, in D.C. So, you know, the, the rise of lifestyle movements as a concept and their increasing importance They've always existed, but we're just starting to examine them more and more, is due to the sentiment of anti-politics that's, that's come about in the United States in the last uh, 30 to 40 years, um, and may actually be decreasing um, due, to, due to the rise of movements like Occupy and Black Lives Matter, that we might see, be seeing a reversal of this anti-political sentiment. But the significance of Dan Dancing Rabbit and other uh, intentional communities comes out of this anti-political sentiment that if I can't if I can't engage um, you know the powers that be effectively because I don't feel like I know enough or I don't feel like my voice will be heard then I will go and be the change I'll go and be the change um, and that leads to the formation of alternative political sites in the in the private sphere in personal lives in everyday actions um, and so of course like I said lifestyle movements like Dancing Rabbit, uh, which I would say is part of a bigger movement of eco-villages, um, see heightened importance in this time of, of when people feel like they're less effective in the, in the public realm. So, um, you know, generally, I'm just going to skip this. I'm going to skip. That, that was the conclusion. That, 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 that said what I needed it to say. So, um, that's the conclusion. I'm going to look ahead a little bit at what else, what else I'm thinking about doing. Um, just kind of outline what my, what my dissertation slash potential book was, will, will look like if I ever sit down and write it. I'm like 20 pages in, so <laughs> I need to do a little bit more than that. Um, so I'm thinking about looking at indicators of lifestyle, doing a chapter on indicators of lifestyle and all the different, uh, all the different things that are done differently here that can be, as a whole, taken as this lifestyle that is uh, you know, disengaged or in contention with um, sort of a broader, more common lifestyle. 
So co-ops and resource sharing, the grow op, the mercantile, uh, the forming mercantile co-op, the uh, DRVC, um, all, all of those different co-ops as, as being especially more prominent here. I mean, they exist elsewhere, but they play such a significant role here. The ELM system, nowhere else on the planet has such a successful alternative currency. Um, green building, feminism, energy production, consensus decision making, uh, gardening, midwifery, as I mentioned, the importance of the Enneagram, which I've like, nowhere else does everybody, like if I met a group, everybody knows their Enneagram. <laughs> I'm a two. I don't know if I, don't know. two, okay. Okay, I'm a, I too. I resisted it for a long time, but uh, I resisted knowing what I was, and then I, it made sense when I, when I found it out. So, um, yeah, Take, taking all of these together and more, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of et cetera. Uh, this, this, this could be five slides long, I'm sure. Um, yeah, all these taken together represent some sort of, some sort of action towards uh, social change. And so I could write a chapter on that. Another one is, is exploring more of this, this notion of collective action reservoirs, how lifestyle politics generate or detract from contentious action. Like, would you, if you were not here, be doing more protesting, be doing more um, direct action sort of things? Um, and, and of course, what other movements do eco-villages overlap with that if you weren't here, you would otherwise be engaged in? And then finally, um, this, this actually might be my first chapter, but I'm going to talk about it last because it, it was, I, I alluded less to it throughout the presentation, is understanding this, this sort of waves of community that have, that have existed throughout US history. Um, and this, is, this draws uh, social movements, uh, literature, they talk about uh, either cycles of contention or waves of protest, that there are times in this country when, um, when there are more protests than, than usual. So uh, right now is definitely a wave, like uh, between you know, 2008, 2009 to the present is a heightened wave of, of activism where we're seeing more protests than usual. You could say the same thing about the late 60s, um, same thing um, uh, in the like, late teens to early 20s when you had um, a lot of union radicals uh, agitating for, for union rights. Uh, and so similarly, I would argue that intentional communities tend to form um, around those times when people feel a sense that they're, they lack efficacy in, in the political process. So before or after there's all that protest, you'll see an, an increase in the, um, the formation of intentional communities. And there's a really good um, uh, work by Rosabeth Moss Cantor uh, where she examines um, a lot of socialist communes uh, from the late 1800s to early 1900s, and then a lot of the sort of um, Skinner, Skinnerian, um, uh, like Walden-esque sort of uh, communes from, from the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, and so there's a lot of really good data on that. And I need to do a little bit um, uh, of digging so I can link periods of heightened intentional community formation to the sort of political issues at the time and what people felt ineffective about so that I can describe how, you know, religious movements, uh, for example, formed when they felt like their voice, you know, you could argue that the Massachusetts Bay Colony was the original intentional community uh, for white people, at least in the United States. That, and they, they formed out of a uh, feeling that they could not practice their religion um, and didn't feel like they could contend against the, the King of England and the Anglican Church. Uh, and so went to form their own community where they could do that freely. Similarly, you have socialist communes that, that felt like you know, they couldn't, couldn't combat the industrial powers of the time and so went to form their own uh, you know, industrial communes uh, like the Oneida community in, up, in upstate New York, um, which today they still, they, they've, it's spun off, if you probably heard of Oneida, the silverware company, that used to be an intentional community that produced that and they spun that off. Uh, but that's where that comes from. And then similarly, what I'm calling psychosocial but could be relabeled in a, in a lot of different ways, but the fact that a lot of uh, communes in the 60s and 70s refer to B.F. Skinner um, in, in their sort of origin story uh, leads me to that label. And then of course, environmentalist uh, eco-village movements of the present. And of course, th those all 
overlap in a lot of ways, and there are intentional communities formed in between those times. But looking at periods where there's heightened amounts of, uh, of intentional community formation uh, also reflects sort of the political issues of the time. And interesting, I just got an email from Mayikwe the other day uh, that I don't remember who that researcher was. They went through the, they went through the uh, uh, Fellowship for Intentional Communities database and showed that between 1990 and 2010, there was a 680% increase in the number of intentional communities in this country, something like that. No, it was 280%. 283 percent increase. So yeah. Between the. It could, yeah. It's uh, well, they they compared the print directory both times. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I I need to dig into their. It's is for a blog post, not for like a rigorous methodological paper. Um, but I I could I could ask those kind of questions. Like yeah. As far as we can tell, and um, like, like as he was analyzing the data on communities that are still around, but they're in the different decades, and there was more of them from before the '80s. You know, that was like the mm -hmm. slump, as far as we can tell. And it also, in your analysis, that seems to be a slump of political activity. And so, when we're looking at that chart where you had the three circles, um, mm -hmm. it seems like there's more of this kind of lifestyle movement feeding other kinds of political action or feeding off of it than there is taking the place of it. Does that seem like um, an accurate statement? I would, say, I would say yes to both. I'd say, I would say you know, in times, there's, there's more political activism than, than, than we can, you know, in recent memory right now, but people are also, there's still, we're still in a, a cycle of heightened interest in intentional communities. So they do kind of feed back on, on each other. Um, yeah. But it doesn't, I don't know if it has to be that way. I mean, something in the wider, you know, atmosphere sort of, you know, zeitgeist, I guess, has to, has to spur people to feel like political action is necessary. Mm -hmm. And then they have to choose whether that political action is going to be contentious or lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So it, it depends on, you know, how much, how much action is being stirred up and whether how much people feel effective or not. So I would argue that, that people feel very, very stirred up right now, and that, it's that, that energy is being divided into, into two different segments. Interesting. Yeah. And that's actually all I had. So now is an excellent time for, for questions, if other people have. Yes, Aaron. What's B.F. Skinner, isn't he a, he's a, uh, he's a psychologist. He's a psychologist. What was his relationship? He wrote a book called Walden II in 1948, and it was essentially uh, it was an unsighted, it was like a novel, but it was a Im, Im, yeah it was an imagine, imaginary sort of community based on his study of the human mind and, and interaction, how he thought a ideal society would be arranged, um, and so I there's a good um, take on that. Uh, it's called Living Walden II by Kathleen Kincaid, who's one of the founders of uh, Twin Oaks. And so she talks about like, how they tried to take some of the principles, um, like free love, um, you know, polyamory, um, and no, no distinct partnership attachments, um, you know, uh, mutual child rearing, um, egalitarian uh, you know, incomes and all that. And they tried to apply it uh, and, and make it work, and how, what what cases it didn't work, and what it did, and when it did. So I think I think uh, communities have largely abandoned that, and I would in fact argue that a lot of the more well-known communities today are are distinctly different from the previous wave in not attempting to be utopian. Um, that a lot of the ones in the 60s and 70s thought there was an ideal arrangement that they could achieve someday, um, and I don't think that that. Um, especially Dancing Rabbit, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there's no, no one's under the delusion that you have a perfect answer that you're going towards. Oh, God, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and similarly, um, yeah, yeah, and, and similarly in the uh, socialist era, you had, you had uh, writers like Charles Fourier from France, he inspired um, probably two or three dozen intentional communities in, in North America 
Um, and his, his writing was basically like, you know, if we arrange our labor in this fashion, then everybody will, you know, everybody will flourish. And he was like, the oceans will turn into lemonade. And, and we will all sup from, from the bounty of nature and, and, and all this. And, and of course, all of those were failures. None of them lasted more than three years. Uh, but there was this big like spurt of, big wave of intentional community formation that was based off of his writing. Um, I, if the oceans turned into lemonade, I would be very happy. And then we would all die because, you know, all the, all the wildlife would die in the ocean. But we would be, have, have a brief, happy lemonade-filled year. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? I'm curious. You seem to be, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be approaching communities as they relate to a sort of liberal idea of how politics works, uh, the classic liberal notion of the private-public distinction. And I wonder if it, if that approach has a limit that maybe some communities at least are proposing an alternative political ontology to a sort of like clear distinction between the two and, and the hierarchy that I think is an implicit in the liberal model. Because it seems like you're, you're talking, again, correct me if I'm wrong, about lifestyle movements as attempting to change for our political um, trends. And, and I'm curious if all communities actually fit into that model. Um, well, not all, not all communities are inherently political. Um, let's see, how do, I, how do I start with that? That's a good question, because, yeah, no, it's a, like, our, you know, you know, modern liberalism, we're not, well, we're not in a liberal era, we're in a neoliberal era, of course, but, um, and I, I would say that, you know, communities are not inherently liberal, um, because they don't, they don't, they don't necessarily prize individual ownership and individual, uh, well, I guess they are. They, I guess they are, like you know, in the in the lower the lowercase l liberal sense. I think when they were talking about cross purposes, and maybe this is yeah. an appropriate discussion for like a. Yeah, I think I think I need to know like like I, I mean, obviously it's in contention with a like Western liberal culture, but you yeah, know. By liberal, I mean uh, by classic liberal, I don't mean economic ideology. I mean the like the classic political ideologies. Like the yeah, political of ideology. individual sovereignty and and. Yes, but also the the idea of a public and private distinction where there are certain actions that are political and some that are not that defines political against the private. And I think that that's something that it's, it's kind of inherent to that model, right? Yeah, and yeah. And, and, and of course, I'm in discussion with other, other social movement scholars who do, and, who do talk about uh, political as being contained within those two realms. Sure. Um, so, but yeah, if we wanted to erase the distinction between public and private, we, we could, you know, that could be an interesting uh, ontological observation of, of, of community as, as erasing sort of our preconceived notions of what private and, and public are. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't propose it as an erasure, but as proposing a different, uh, like a, just an inherently different political ontology. Yeah. That, that yeah. Politics needs to be conceived of differently if you were to understand that some form of community. I'm, I'm not, compa I'm not under trying to necessarily understand community as community. I'm trying to understand community as, as in contrast to right. the wider exactly. culture, as in, okay. as in a source of change for the wider culture. Right. that's awesome. So, I, my, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, would, uh, I would refer you to Amitai Etzioni if you wanted to talk cool. about, uh, you know, <laughs> alternative, alternative conceptions of, of self in, in community. You said ontology twice. Yeah. <laughs> Ontology is a way of uh, understanding, uh, like how we think about knowledge, it, or how we think about like how we know what we know. Okay, okay, let's 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 go, let's let's get a beer after this and talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Good. There will be a test after this. <laughs> Everybody brought your blue books, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, are you looking at like percentages of people, or is it just based on like, just, like interviews? Did you look at like how many people were like this, and how many people were like that? Or, like... 
No. Not like an overall general. Yeah. Person. You mean like how people f like ask people on a Likert scale? I feel this way about you know protests yeah. and no, I I just I just did. No, no, I just I just did semi-structured interviews, um, and. That might that might be an inch, another another approach, but that's you know I'm not, I'm a very qualitative guy, so Go. one two three four five. Um, no, I'm not. Oh, that's fine. I'll remember it at some point. Does anybody else have questions? I feel like we're I, I'll keep going as long as people have questions. This isn't really a question, but I just had a wondering about um, if we were to survey all of the incoming visitors to the visitor program as to whether they saw Dancing Rabbit as activism through lifestyle. I'd be curious to know what, what they thought at the beginning versus the end, or if that would be an interesting mm. like, test sample. If you started doing that and then handed that over to me, <laughs> I would be eternally grateful. Gosh, you're talking to um, a person, but not for much longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll be next year. We'll have to work on that for next year. Yeah. I, I probably, well, if you all do it on your own and then give it to me, then then it would be fine, but if I have any hand in it from the beginning, then I'd have to get my institutional approval. Is it, does it really qualify though if we do it ourselves, or are we? Not yeah, uh, I might get I might get uh, disqualified from like peer review or including it in a peer review journal because because I didn't I didn't have a hand in the research myself and can't verify its rigor. Can you um, create the questions for us and then? I I still have to, I'd have to get institutional approval. And it would be very likely that every one of the visitors would have to sign a release, mm -hmm. which is kind of a steep thing to ask of, of visitors as they're coming in. I, I like the idea. Um, and if you think that the vi visitor program would be, like if that would be something you'd be willing to incorporate, then yeah, I would totally do it. I just want to be upfront about the limitations. <laughs> yeah. That would actually that could actually be its own paper. <laughs> that totally could be its own paper. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, do you feel like there's other um, like in the academic movement? Where is this idea starting to show up of lifestyle as movement? Is um, it traction or it's gaining a little bit of traction. Um, there's maybe like if I search for this term. There's maybe like five or six articles that that'll pop up since 2012, which is good because it doesn't appear before 2012. Uh, uh, the book I'm reading right now by my advisor, who wrote about uh, voluntary simplicity, uh, she wrote a book on several voluntary simplicity like circles, meeting circles, and she uses the term culture movement, and says that voluntary simplicity is not a social movement. And I'm saying yes, it is. Well, we need to reconceptualize this because. Uh, either, either we are from a different vantage point in society right now, or, or the notion of what it means to be a voluntar voluntary, volunta ugh, voluntarily simple has, has changed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm hoping to push some new ground with this, which is... Oh, Victoria would never come here. Oh, my God. The pooping in a toilet, not having air conditioning, no way. No way. I mean, she loves she loves the idea of this place. She's an old school radical. She wrote her first book about um, like uh, union uh, union battles in in um, I think it was in Seattle uh, in like the late eighteen uh, no early nineteen hundreds. And her book is is called How Many Machine Guns Does It Take to Cook One Meal? Wow. And it's about all the violence of of the union movements. So. You know, she's she's definitely on board with leftism. She complains all the time that Columbia is too too conservative because um, she's from she went to Berkeley. Right. Um, you don't think she'd stay at the Mercantile still? Oh, maybe. Jeez, that would be a push. And they have red wine, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you realize this is going on the internet, right? Oh boy. <laughs> you censor that part out. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She. No, she's a she's a good advisor. Yeah. Censored. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I bet I bet my uh, one of my other one of the other my other committee members would totally would totally come. The one who wrote about voluntary simplicity, she would totally come. Cool. Well, this is 
It's great to have Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. And listening to me blab on. So. Yeah.